Good morning, people. This sermon is being recorded for Sunday morning, January 31, already at the end of January. Uh, so we are continuing yet in our um, not meeting face-to-face, uh, -face, but meeting virtually by me recording these sermons, and I put them up on online for you to listen to. Of course, I am recording this uh, earlier than January 31, but it will go up on Sunday morning, January 31. Uh, and uh, we will continue this way. Keep an eye out on our Facebook page. Um, we will have to make a decision on how long we will continue a meeting virtually rather than meeting face to face. And I will put it up there when we uh, go back uh, to meeting face to face again. So let's get into our message. As you remember, we are in the book of Ruth. This week, we're going to look at Ruth chapter four. Um, not the entire chapter. There's some at the end that we next week. Next week will be the last sermon in the book of Ruth. Uh, we have had, oh, I don't know how many, five or so already uh, from the book of Ruth. Um, and this one. Uh, deals with chapter four. You remember last week we talked in chapter three um, on Naomi's instruction. Ruth went down to the threshing floor uh, where the men had been celebrating uh, the Jewish holy day, the end of the uh, barley harvest, and she slept at Boaz's feet. In the middle of the night, Boaz woke up and found somebody sleeping at his feet and talked to her. And she reminded him that, um, Boaz, you are my kinsman redeemer. But Boaz said that he knew of one. There was another guy. I don't know how they um, figured this, but there was some relative who was closer, was closer uh, in line to be the kinsman redeemer than what uh, Boaz was. So Boaz told Ruth, don't worry, I will follow up on this matter. I will check with him. And this is the story of that. Okay, so let's get into it. So first, I always start off with my today's humor. Now, this really, I don't know how humorous it is. I think it is somewhat humorous, but it is a very poignant story. Um, let me read it to you. A preacher accepted a call to a new church. Soon he had an occasion to ride the city bus. Okay, comes to the new church, has to ride the city bus. When he sat down, he discovered that the driver had given him a quarter too much change. He thought to himself, you'd better give the quarter back. It would be wrong to keep it. Then he thought, you know how you go back and forth and you're thinking, oh, forget it. It's only a quarter. Who would worry about such a small amount? When, he came, when his stock came, he paused momentarily at the door, and then he handed the quarter to the driver and said, here, you gave me too much change. The driver, with a smile, replied, I know. You are the new preacher in town. I just wanted to see how honest of man you are. I think I will see you next Sunday in your church. Yeah. So he uh, was kind of testing the new preacher in town. Uh, the preacher passed this test I, by being honest. Huh? Okay, here's my outline. Luke, uh, uh, Ruth chapter 4. Starting off the first couple of verses, the custom of redeeming. Now, I called it a custom. It really is built into the law. But the custom of the way they exactly did it, the way Boaz did it with the elders and the taking off of the shoe and all of that, it was kind of the custom of how they did it in, in Ruth's time during the judges period. Point number two, Boaz lays out the case for the land, verses three and four. So it wasn't just Ruth involved. Naomi had a piece of land. Well, the land wasn't doing her any good. She is an elderly widow, wasn't farming the land. The land had some value, but the land was supposed to stay in the family. That's why the Lord had set up the, uh, in the law, the kinsman redeemer purchasing it 
so that it stayed in the family. It didn't. It, it, they didn't. They should. They weren't to just take their land and sell it to anybody because then, then the family would would lose it. Remember, the land was an inheritance from the Lord. We talked about that in earlier messages. Um, so Boaz lays out the case for the land for this guy. Uh, but then Boaz talks to the guy that not only are you to redeem the land from Naomi, but along with it, there is this widow whom you are, according to the Old Testament law, you are supposed to marry and raise up his children. Well, then this guy refuses. We'll get into that. Point number four, the custom of the sandal. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Point number five, Boaz redeems the land and Ruth, verses nine and ten. And then my last point, the witness and blessing of the elders. So before the elders, Boaz carries out this transaction and the elders have witnessed it and the elders give their blessing to it. All right, so let's get into this. The custom of redeeming, verses one and two. Now, Boaz had gone up. Remember, this is the next morning after he had talked to Ruth down at the threshing floor, told her that he would take care of this matter. And uh, when you remember last week when Ruth got home and told Naomi all about it, Naomi says, you don't worry about it. Boaz will take care of the matter. Well, here he is taking care of the matter right away. Now, Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So it literally names him, calls him the, the Redeemer. He was uh, the relative who was closer to Elimelech. Elimelech was Naomi's husband who had passed away. Uh, he was closer than Boaz was. You know, was Boaz a third cousin and he was a second cousin? We don't know, it doesn't say. But so this Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Okay. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Okay. I got some comments. Oh, no, here's some, here's some cross references. Maybe I put these um, a little too early, but here's some cross references dealing with the kinsman redeemer and the... Um, both the land, the inherited land, and the marrying the widow. Here in um, Leviticus 25, 25, it built into the law, the Lord did this. If your brother becomes poor, now that word brother could mean literally the, you know, the blood brother, or it could mean the closest relative. At least Israel was practicing if the, if the uh, like Elimelech had no brother, um, it would become the closest relative who was to fulfill this. If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer, there it is, and his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. And we talked about that word ga'al uh, already, um, kinsman redeemer, the, the closest relative was to purchase that land back so that it did not go out of the family because that land was an inheritance from the Lord. When they conquered the land under Joshua, we looked at all of that in some, some references. When they conquered the land under Joshua by lot, it was divided up among the tribes and then it was divided up among all the family. And the land was a very important thing to each of the families. Well, Elimelech, um, was gone, there his family sat, and Naomi, um, or his there his land sat, and Naomi couldn't do anything with it. So um, uh, this was in the law of how to that land was to be taken care of. And now here's another one, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5. If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. 
Okay, so uh, here, uh, we, I got a definition of this a little bit later, but these two um, portions of the law, both in Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 25, are involved in this matter. Okay, so, um, so they come to the gate, Boaz calls this guy aside, the closer redeemer, and then he calls some elders um, of the city. This is the way they performed the transactions of the day, and they all sat down. So the elders would be a witness of the transaction. Talk about that a little bit later in the message. Um, and he's going to talk to this guy about what his responsibility is as the kinsman redeemer. Okay, verses three and four, Boaz lays out the case for the land. Okay, not talking about Ruth yet, but the land that Naomi has. Then he said to the redeemer, this other guy, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belongs to our relative Elimelech. Okay, Naomi needs the money to live on. She needs to sell it, but the land is not supposed to be sold outside of the family. So Boaz is reminding this guy that, hey, we are the closest relatives. You are the closest relative. It is your obligation under the law to uh, purchase it. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. Those elders were there to be a witness of this whole transaction. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and then I come after you. Well, this guy probably thought about it for a little bit. Oh, there's an opportunity to buy some land. Uh, I'm a farmer. I can use this land of Naomi's. I'll give her some money to live on. And he said, I will redeem it. Okay, so this guy, here's the case about the land, thought it was a good idea. Um, he is the kinsman redeemer. He has the option to buy the land first before Boaz does. Boaz says, if you don't, I will buy it. Um, Boaz was a landowner. You remember that initially Ruth went to the field of Boaz and was harvesting uh, or was gleaning behind his harvesters. So Boaz was a a uh, prominent landowner in the town of Bethlehem. But here this guy had the right to redeem it before him. And he said he'd go ahead and do that. Okay, so some comments. Boaz lays out the case to the closer redeemer. This closer redeemer's name is never mentioned, nor his relationship to Naomi's family. Um, all Boaz said was our relative uh, Elimelech. So they were some kind of real relative. And Boaz knew that he was a little bit closer of a relative than what Boaz was. Uh, but this guy has never, has never mentioned exactly what the relationship was, nor is his name given. But Boaz knew he was a closer kinsman than himself. This man knew of the land and felt it would be a good deal for him to get the land back into the family. Uh, he felt he could use it. Okay, I thought there was another point there. Okay, so he um, felt he could use it, and he says, yeah, I'll go ahead and buy that. All right, now Boaz tells him of something else. Remember, we looked at that Leviticus 25, and we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 25. There are two parts to being this kinsman redeemer. So Boaz now tells this guy the second part, reminds this guy the second part, verses five and six. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, and in order, uh, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Oh, so, so there's more to this deal. Uh, yeah, buying a, some property is 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 a good deal. You can use it, give Naomi some money for it, and you can raise crops on it. But now Boaz reminds him, oh, there's an also a part, another part to the law here. 
There is a widow of marrying age who has no children. And according to that law that we looked at, Deuteronomy chapter five, 25, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, you are to marry this uh, widow and you are to raise up uh, um, somebody in, in the name of her past husband, her, her dead husband. Okay, so no, verse 20, now verse 6. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Boaz had already said, if you don't buy the land, I'll buy the land. Implied in there is that if you don't do this deal, I'll do the whole deal. So this guy says to Boaz, take my right of redemption yourself, or I cannot redeem it. Okay, so he's turning this down. He says, I know you're here, Boaz. I know that you could do it. Um, so I, the land and the widow, they come together. Um, I cannot uh, do this because he says, uh, I will impair my own inheritance. Uh, what exactly does that mean? I don't know. Um, I got some comments on here. First of all, the Leverite marriage. And again, I got this from Wikipedia. It says here, Leverite marriage is a type of marriage in which the brother of the deceased man is obligated to marry his brother's widow. Okay, uh, this is not uh, found only in the Jewish culture, though it is built into the Jewish law in the Old Testament. The term Leverite, Leverite, Leverite is a derivative of the Latin word Levere, meaning husband's brother, husband's brother. So um, comes from the Latin term. Wasn't given this name in the Old Testament, but it's a name that it has picked up uh, uh, since uh, the, la the Latin language is there. The right marriage can, at its most positive, serve as protection for the widow and her children, ensuring that they have a male provider uh, and protector. Um, that's just in general, in other cultures. Then he gets specific here. I say he, the author of this Wikipedia article. He says, uh, he gives us a Jewish word. Yabum, yab, I don't know the exact pronunciation. Yabum is the form of liberate marriage found in Deuteronomy chapter 25. And I only gave you verse five, but verses five through 10, under which the brother of a man who dies without children is permitted and encouraged to marry the widow. Okay, so um, the Jews had um, a name for that. The article did go on and say that this was used to be practiced um, quite commonly in our culture today. It is not practiced so much anymore, but it used to be uh, when widows had a very hard, difficult time in society without a husband, that the husband's brother would marry the widow. And that was built into the law in Deuteronomy chapter 25. Okay, some comments about this guy turning it down. Buying the land from Naomi would be good for both Naomi, she gets some money out of it, and the closer redeemer. He could use the land and make himself some money. So it would be profitable. So in this matter, he's not thinking about, oh, those poor widows. He's thinking about, what would be best for himself. He could use the land. He was a farmer, could raise more crops. He's expanded his farm. Uh, he's thinking that would be good for himself. But marrying Ruth would not work for him. It says it would, the text says, impair his own inheritance. And as I said, we don't know exactly what that means. Um, uh, Ruth had children from this guy, and they would be really from her former husband. Um, so he he turned it down. He was not willing to sacrifice for himself to help the two poor widow ladies. Huh? He was only thinking about himself rather than thinking about how he could help these ladies. I say here, Many times we, we as Christians, are not willing to help others because it is too inconvenient for uh, to us. This man could have been thinking about the ladies and thought, well, I can help them out here. 
but he he didn't want to to do that. Uh, we need to inconvenience ourselves to be able to help other people. That's, I think, a very good application of this. So this closer relative now turns it down. Um, didn't feel he could perform the liberate marriage, uh, fulfill the laws uh, in the Old Testament, but he knew that Boaz was there. Okay, point number four, the custom of the sandal. So um, Boaz has gathered the elders of the city of Bethlehem, the town of Bethlehem, and this uh, kinsman redeemer who was closer than he. He's laid out the case for both the land and Ruth. She, he has, has turned it down. Now let's look what happens. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. Isn't that interesting? The custom in former times. We already mentioned earlier uh, in the book of Ruth that Ruth was probably written early during the period of the Judges. The Judges goes on some 300 years. Uh, we said it possibly could have been written during the time of Gideon when the uh, Midianites were ruining all their crops, and that's what's caused the famine that caused Elimelech and Naomi to leave. Uh, we don't know exactly, but here, by the time the book was written, and as we said, we don't know who it was written by, possibly Samuel. Uh, by the time it was written, this custom had passed by the wayside. But in former times, uh, it was a custom in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction, okay? Boaz and this guy are doing a transaction. He is a closer redeemer, has the right to buy the land, has the right to marry um, Ruth, uh, but he is turning that down. Um, so they gotta confirm this before the elders of the city. The one draws off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel, of attesting in Israel, okay? So it goes on, verse eight. So when the Redeemer, the guy who was closer than Boaz, said to Boaz, buy it yourself, he drew off his sandal. Isn't that interesting? Um, it was, it was a like signing a contract. We had said that. Uh, this uh, redeemer who was closer than Boaz, he didn't want to do it, and Boaz did. So this guy took off his sandal before the elders and gave it to Boaz as a sign. And you can understand this, the symbolism here. Uh, the sandal is what you walk on, is what you, 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 your life is carried out on your sandals. He takes it off and he gives it to Boaz as a sign. Boaz, I am giving up my right as a redeemer, and I am giving it to you for you to go ahead and be the kinsman redeemer of these of these two widows. Okay, I have some comments here on uh, what I just was talking about in former times. I already talked about that. Says our author. So the custom of the sandal was not in use anymore at the time of the writing. But it seems that the removing of the sandal before the elders of the city symbolized the giving up of your options as the kinsman redeemer. That's a good way of, of stating it. This guy, this closer kinsman took off his sandal, gave it to Boaz, symbolizing that he was giving up his right as the kinsman redeemer. This man did not feel he could marry Ruth. It would jeopardize his own inheritance. So he took off his sandal before the elders of the city, signifying that he was turning his responsibility as kinsman redeemer to buy the land of, from Naomi and to marry Ruth. He was giving that up and turning that over to Boaz. Uh, what did I do? All right, point number five, Boaz redeems the land and Ruth comes along with it. Uh, perhaps Ruth was more important to Boaz than the land was. Okay, verses nine and 10. 
And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to, and these are the two children, you remember at the beginning of the chapter, uh, Chilion and Malon. Uh, I don't remember which, which of the, I don't know if it ever said which, uh, who married who, Chilion married Ruth or Malon uh, was the husband of Ruth. Uh, but Abimelech, or, uh, Boaz is buying them back from Elimelech and the two boys that have all passed away. Verse 10. Also Ruth, the Moabite, the widow. Oh, here it is. It's very clear. I'm sorry. The widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gates of his native people. You are witnesses this day. Okay, so um, Boaz, before the elders and to this closer kinsman redeemer, he makes a proclamation, takes off his sandal, um, confirming it, uh, the witnesses were there, you know, if anyone ever says, yeah, well, what gave him the right to do that? Well, he purchased it. He did. Remember that? Remember that transaction in the city gate and the elders of the city uh, would remember that. It was like uh, recording, recording it at the uh, at the city hall that it was on record that um, Boaz had purchased this. Some comments I make here. So Boaz promises to redeem and re to redeem the land. He will pay Naomi probably a good price for the land of Elimelech and the two sons. Hey, he was a he was a fairly well to do land owner. What did it say earlier? It said a man of um, prominence in the city of Bethlehem. So he's going to help Naomi out as his poor widow and he's going to purchase the land. She now can live very nicely on this money that uh, Boaz will give to her. And I'm sure um, Boaz will take care of her as well. This he promises to the elders that he would marry. Oh, yeah, he would marry Ruth to raise children to the name of the former husband. Okay, so that was witnessed before the elders of the church. The elders of the city was, were like the legal system. Uh, we have in our day. They would always be able to testify that this transaction had happened. You know, like I said, the elders uh, could say, oh yeah, I remember back four or five years ago that Boaz purchased this land and that was a deal back there at the city gates. All right. So verses 11 and 12, when we come to the end of this chapter, the witness and blessing of the elders and all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. Boaz has made the proclamation of what he's going to do. Uh, and then they say this. So, so first of all, they're witnesses to this. Okay, we are witnesses. And then they think this is a very good thing that Boaz is doing. So they make this blessing on him. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house, like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah. That was another name for Bethlehem. And be renowned in Bethlehem. So they give this, they give this blessing on him. You remember Rachel and Leah? Rachel and Leah were the wives of Jacob. You remember the story? He loved Rachel, and but the dad gave uh, gave him Leah first, and then he had to work again for Rachel. Uh, and they too were his wives, and we, all of Israel comes from that. Twelve children they all had, um, making up Israel. Uh, so they pronounced this blessing. Rachel and Leah were were re renowned in Israel, and they say, may the Lord make this woman like Rachel and Leah. Okay, and then verse 12, and a blessing goes on, and may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. 
because of the offspring that the Lord will give to you uh, by this. Uh, it's behind my video there. You're a woman. You're a woman. Uh, so they pronounce this blessing on Boaz. Application. Um, all the all the Bible commentaries and all as you read this, you know, if you know about the the kinsman redeemer built into the Old Testament law, um, it reminds us of what Jesus Christ has done for us. I say here, here's the application. The application of the whole book of Ruth, Boaz and Jesus, uh, Ruth and us. So Ruth is kind of like a like we are um she is a poor widow lady who in the society of her day is unable to make it on her own and Boaz redeemed her and married her gave her a good home uh just like Jesus our kinsman redeemer is redeemed up let me let me go her story is remarkably like ours, I say. In her, we see someone who is unable to help herself and needs rescue. She must request someone specific to be her kinsman redeemer. She went down to the um, floor and asked, reminded Boaz of what he was supposed to do, asked him to redeem her so he could restore and protect her in exchange for her hand in marriage, we are like that. We are lost in sin. The Bible says we are dead in sin. We cannot redeem ourselves. No matter how many good works that we do, we can never redeem ourselves. All of us are in need of rescue and we can't do it ourselves. We need a kinsman redeemer named Jesus. He's the one who loves us so much, he willingly paid the price for our sin, which is death. This is why Jesus had to become a human being. He left the realms of glory and came to earth as a little baby born in Bethlehem. Uh, we've just gone through the Christmas season a few weeks back and where we're reminded of what Jesus has done. But he was fully God and he was fully man because he was our kinsman redeemer, he paid the price so that we could be redeemed. And he has made us his bride so we can enjoy his grace and blessings for eternity. All right, let's close this message in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that each one who listens to this message has acknowledged that Jesus is their kinsman redeemer and has accepted him as their savior. I pray, Lord, that we would be thankful for all that you have done for us in redeeming us and saving us, Father. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.